Well, good morning, y'all. Good to see you this uh, Lord's Day morning. And uh, the first thing I want to say this morning for myself and on behalf of uh, Abby and Alex and Lisa is a really big thank you to you all who put in so much effort to help us have our um, have that wedding yesterday. We're glad to leave the uh, decorations. Marsha, you played a key role in uh, enhancing. Uh, Lisa did a lot of work leading up, and then you were able to work a little magic and, and do all that. Um, by the way, I did help uh, haul these ferns from Morgan County, just in case you want to want to be a friend. <laughs> Uh, and we'll bring them back to you uh, here in, I don't know, whatever, next day or two. Um, and uh, for all of you who helped over there at the uh, kind of get set up at the recital, or the, um, or the reception, sorry. I guess we did do a little bit of dancing. It was a little bit like a recital. Uh, <laughs> so it was kind of fun. And uh, uh, so our, our, our insomnia now is not about uh, like the wedding, thankfully. It's more about, oh no. Now they got to live life. They, they got now. There's all kinds of things to worry about in front of them. So uh, pray for us and pray for them. Um, uh, let me mention this. Um, I think we're going. I think we're looking forward to a really nice Sabbath rest today. Uh, so in terms of like uh, sticking around and eating, but there's a lot of leftover food in that refrigerator in there. And we would like to encourage you to take a look and see if there's anything you, you would uh, want to have for lunch today or whatever, um, because there's there's a lot of stuff in there. We we had good attendance, but we we obviously had a good uh, quite a few that we were expecting it. That, you know, that, uh, and we, we know the reasons why several didn't come. Thankfully, they they want to be safe because of illness and such. So um, so anyway, we thank you. We thank you. I mean, if I mean, it's overwhelming, really, um, the effort that you all put in and uh, made this thing happen. Um, uh, if, if you heard, I, I, Wes is working on video, so I'll be anxious to kind of see it. Um, not only is your own wedding day a blur, but in some ways, just things a blur for me and for us. It's like warp speed all day, you know, and... Uh, then like 30 minutes before the service is like when in excruciating slow motion. It's like, when is this thing gonna happen? So uh, it's kind of weird how all that happens, but um, I wrote out that little message thinking, this is, gonna ha this is gonna be how I can stay composed. I didn't even get through the first sentence till it's like, uh-oh, this is about to happen. I'm about to cry like a baby right here in front of everybody. So, but the Lord was gracious, it's a, it was a, a good way. Uh, it, we brought them together, so thank you very much. Just notice uh, it, on the announcements there, I'll move toward this. Um, we delayed the fellowship meal for one week. We encourage you all to come. Uh, we have Shelly visit. Shelly, you would be our guest, and we don't want you to feel like you need to bring in if you're able to make it on Wednesday at 6. I don't know whether work allows, but you are welcome, and you don't bring in. You just come and eat. We may have we may have some of that still here. I don't know. Uh, uh, just depends on <laughs> just depends on how you how you deal with it. So, um, but uh, Wednesday, we uh, start at six, start the line somewhere around six. So uh, you go ahead and do that. Um, we'll go ahead, I think, let's see, Steve, you might have a conflict, right? I can't remember what our schedule is, but we'll plan to meet and pray Friday, but we'll, uh, we'll kind of see uh, for those who get together. I think the women's groups, even though Nancy is um, kind of laid up, there's, there's Bill. We're going to get an update, see how she is. I think the Tuesday group will continue to meet if they uh, do that, even if she's unable to. And the book club uh, Wednesday will carry on with your schedule. Um, you'll see there some of the other details. But once again, thank you. And uh, it's, uh, um, I don't know, your, your, the blessings of God are made known through things like this in ways that, you know, the ordinary routine uh, may not reveal them. So we, we are grateful to you. We're grateful to God for his, uh, all that he's done. Let's take just a minute uh, to uh, bow in prayer and meditation as we prepare our hearts for worship today.
help us in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It's one of the simple refrains of the scriptures and of the Psalms is to recognize the greatness of God and especially evident as the maker or the creator of all things. Um, today we come not only to acknowledge and to ascribe glory and honor to God as creator, but also as our redeemer in Jesus Christ. And we gather today uh, for that purpose. Let's join together in a hymn of praise, 116. It starts out speaking about the glory of all that's made and the beauty of the earth, but then it, then it covers many blessings. 116, for the beauty of the earth. Let's stand together as we sing our praise. see what you've made and know of your grand and glorious creative power. But also we come today recognizing and ascribing to you glory for the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ, the marvelous and gracious and merciful way in which you have not abandoned us to our own devices and to the sinful ways of our hearts, but you have come and you have redeemed us in Christ. The very Son of God who left the glories of heaven took on a human nature, walked on this earth, endured all the temptations and struggles, and overcame, fully fulfilling your law at every point, and who took upon himself our sin in dying that atoning death on the cross. And Lord, we come also to glorify you for the marvelous resurrection that won the victory over sin and death, and that Jesus is now ascended to the right 
hand of the Father, that place of power and privilege and rule, and one day he will gather us up to himself for all eternity. We pray that that good news will be our comfort and our hope even this day as we come and worship. So come among us by your spirit and draw us near to yourself as we come in faith. We come in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. In front of the hymnals, the Apostles' Creed, the ancient summary of the Christian faith that um, it's, it's uh, divided in those three parts, recognizing the Trinity, the triunity of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and also lists some of the works of the Son, um, well, works of all three, and as well as the blessings of those who are believers at the end. So with that in mind, let me ask you, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born in the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to turn to page 821 and back. 821, we'll find Psalm 1. 101. Psalm 101. You may notice I'm skipping Psalm 100. I'll probably move that in as a call to worship and read the whole thing. It's kind of brief, but uh, as we, uh, kind of this section here, it moves into some of the uh, psalms that are especially praise psalms. They start with praise the Lord and go for a while, indicating various reasons uh, that we should praise God. Uh, Psalm 101, uh, well, there's reasons for praise, but it's uh, especially speaking about, again, the rule of uh, God in our lives through Christ and, of course, some of the expectations of our um, obedience and faithful living. So let's look to Psalm 101 here, instruction from the, from the Old Testament. We'll read responsibly. I'll uh, read the light print Follow with the bold. Let me remind you, this is the word of God. I will sing of your love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate. They will not cling to me. Men of perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him will I not undo. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He is will No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evil doer from the city of the Lord. The Lord has blessing uh, to read. We understand the proper application of this. Um, it seems that this is a, this may be a fuller expansion of what is said in Psalm 1, which, it, you know, it says, uh, blessed is the plan, and then it has the negative, who does not walk in the way of the wicked, stand in the place of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the way of the Lord. But that first section 
there's a resistance to allowing evil and sinful and wicked influence in your life. And so there's a, there's a span, I will not, I will not, I will do this in order to make sure uh, that uh, the blameless, uh, not the absolutely perfect life, okay, we're going we're gonna to fail, but the, a life that's devoted to obedience and holiness is the focus and the priority. And that is what God is indeed working in us. So um, that should be our prayer. Uh, that should be our regular prayer. Uh, not only say I will, but Lord, help me to do that uh, so I may have the proper influence and sanctification to serve you well, to live holy, a holy life. Let's turn over to 94. How firm a foundation. Um, six verses in this. Um, let's go ahead and sing all six this morning. And uh, I know Ronnie will be pleased with that. In fact, he would suggest that we just start back over at one and sing them all six a second time. It's his favorite, his favorite hymn. And uh, let's sing them all. Let's, we might remain seated as we're singing and just sing of uh, Christ our foundation.
assurance of scripture is that uh, God will be with us. Christ assures us of his presence with us and that we will never, ever be forsaken. Um, um, <laughs> I checked that. There was a couple of weeks, a couple of Sundays where I was trying to run the Facebook live stream and my mother finally broke and said, hey, I, I tried to get on there the last two weeks. And I was like, well, she's just trying to make excuses. No, I, she was really trying. I realized somehow or another got turned to a private setting. And, and I think, yeah, I think Brenda ran into that too. So I got paranoid again to run down. But there are people watching. Uh, so good. I can see their little names on there. If I had time, I would wave at them. There's a way to wave. You know, wave at Pam Bowman. Wave at Chip Dunn. So uh, those are the two names I saw. And I think there's more. Um, let's uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's lift up our concerns to him. Father, we are grateful uh, that you hear us. We have the great uh, assurance of never being forsaken. You are with us to the end. And uh, your grace is sufficient to carry us forward in all things. You are about the business of sanctifying us as your people, continuing to work uh, within our hearts to purify us that we would more and more resemble the holiness of Jesus Christ, that we would less and less be given over to the sinful impulses of our hearts. We thank you for that. Many times I, and maybe others here, recognize that without your grace at work, the spirit in our hearts, we sometimes wonder where we would be, that where our own natural inclinations would have taken us. For that we are grateful that by your grace you call us and we are united to Christ in faith and we are clothed with his righteousness and he now dwells in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and is about the business of making us more and more holy. We pray that you do so. Give us minds and hearts that are cooperative and willing in this process that we will desire over all things. Help us to resist the allurements of various things that can pull us away. Some of those things, not necessarily bad in themselves, but can easily consume our hearts that we have no place left for you. So help us to avoid that. Keep us strong in faith and yet humble in faith that we always recognize our need for you and always seek you in humility. We do um, today lift up to you the burdens and the concerns of the, those of our church family who are especially uh, have needs. Um, we think of uh, Marilyn and Carol going through their cancer treatments and the testing and we would pray especially for them that you would grant them strength to endure and not, not only would you touch and heal and strengthen their physical bodies, but would also grant to them a strong faith that even in their time of weakness and uncertainty and struggle, they would find hope in you as they depend on you, as they lean on you. And help us to be faithful in lifting them up and assisting in whatever ways we can. Uh, we pray uh, for Nancy this week, Nancy uh, Newcomb, as she is recovering from the injury and the surgery. And we pray for her that you would um, bless her during this time. Uh, certainly uh, a situation she wouldn't desire. And yet, it may be that in this condition you have blessings to bestow. And so we would pray that you help her to recover well, but also to benefit from perhaps a time of less activity. Um, and show your grace in new ways. Lord, your word tells us that when we are weak, then we are strong, because not because uh, we're strong in and of ourselves, but we find that strength that you provide in those situations of weakness. Just as you did the Apostle Paul, who learned that lesson, he pled to have his thorn in the flesh removed, and you said no, but that your grace is sufficient. May we learn that lesson find comfort and hope in that, that your grace is sufficient for whatever we face. All of us have um, different challenges we face day by day. And we need you in the midst of those. 
the decisions we have to make, the various relations, affiliations that we have, that we have to negotiate those relationships. We are called to live a life very different than what the world presents to us. And we would pray that you help us in that. That whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever we say, it would be something that reflects the beauty and the glory of Christ who is in us. Help us to die to sin, just as Christ died to sin, but also to live to righteousness as he was raised to new life. Impart that resurrection power to us that we may reflect him well, share him well with those around us. We love you. We thank you for hearing us. We, uh, today, I also think about it. We, our attention yesterday was predominantly on our wedding, but we also call to mind the memory of the terrorist attack 20 years ago. We would uh, pray for those who still grieve. We would pray for our country, that you would protect us from such uh, attacks. We would especially pray uh, for your people who may have suffered, believers. But even in that, they would find even greater hope in Christ. We would pray that you would help us to be earnest and diligent in praying for our nation, whether it's regarding security or whether it's to pray for our leaders, that your divine wisdom would be imparted, that they would lead us well. We would pray for peace and righteousness of God to be poured out on our land, and that um, we as Christians can show the way of what good citizenship is. But we think about our nation. We, we, we struggle with many things that we observe, and yet we know that we are quite blessed to be in this place, living here. And uh, we would call on you to move, to protect, to care, and to move in a sweeping revival, not only in this land, but across the globe. That hurting, sinful, crushed souls will find life and hope and peace in Jesus Christ. So give us strength, motivation, energy to proclaim Christ in all his glory. We love you. Thank you. Hear us and answer according to your good will. For we come in through Christ our Lord. Amen. As the ushers now to come as we worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. bestow upon us material and spiritual. We bring these gifts before you. We lay them before you. We ask your blessing upon them. We make our ministry effective in this place. And equip us and enable us to contribute to the greater kingdom work of God.
gospel ministry around the world. We love you and thank you for every good thing. We bring our offering of prayer in Jesus' name. We taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I apologize, I think. After singing, I did not flip this thing back on for the prayer. And for those who didn't hear, that might have been the finest pastoral prayer ever. <laughs> and like Forrest Gump, the sound system was off and you know, didn't get to hear it. So I just saw some of Forrest Gump last week, and so I'm thinking about his speech on the mall that nobody heard. So, uh, Sorry. Uh, I'm used to having that thing always running, and now all of a sudden I've got a thing I'm turning on my ear. Um, I'm going to give a shout out. I don't know, uh, she's probably not on there right now, but I've, I've come to learn that um, somebody special to me is regularly, uh, she goes to her church, she comes home, and uh, uh, well, I don't know if, but she will always find my uh, service and my sermon or our service and, 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 and listen each week since all this stuff has gone. So many churches are online. And uh, at least before um, the, the pastor left, there's another church around Sweetwater that she would also watch. And that's my cousin, Laura Lee Hauser. If Laura Lee sees this, I may give her another shout out at the beginning of the service sometime. Marley was at the wedding yesterday and enjoyed some dancing there near the end before she left. She's there with her mom. And uh, so uh, Laura Lee is one of our faithful online viewers that I didn't, I didn't know until just a few weeks ago. She, she's, her mom said she comes home every, every week. So she's our, uh, one of our, our cousins and my cousins. And uh, uh, she's been helping us uh, rejoice in life for a long time. And uh, so we thank you for looking in as well as everybody who's out there in the, whatever you call it, uh, the cloud or the virtual reality. I don't know. So, but anyway, uh, thank you for looking in. And we're glad, uh, even though this isn't probably the highest quality, best thing, I've been studying. I'm actually trying to figure out if there's, if there's some simple things we could do to improve those things. And we may look at that soon. Um, but even some of our folks who are not very limited or unable to get here uh, are watching in and can stay connected with the service. So we're, uh, we could be grateful for that. Uh, even as we've had to deal with some disruptions of life, uh, we can be grateful that there's, you know, technology uh, sometimes can't live with it, but uh, we've now gotten to where we seem to not be able to live without it. So anyway, let's turn to Colossians 3 this morning. Um, we were debating, we've talked about this a while back, should we take, take time off or not? And we've got some other weeks. I know in a few weeks, uh, or in October, we're probably going to use the school fall break and get away. And um, but we thought, no, I think it would work. I mean, it, there's no doubt it could have been beneficial to be off today and hand it over to Ron or somebody. Uh, but uh, we're here. Uh, we're we're, we're going to be here. We're going to be here. It's not like you you you, you knew I wasn't going. I would have to escape late last night if I was going to get away. So or early this morning. So uh, no, let's keep on with Colossians. Let's just uh, let's do this thing. We're at Colossians three here as we're going through this book and uh, learning some of the some of these uh, important teachings and lessons to help us in our Christian faith, even as Paul was concerned about the faith of Colossian Christians and. Uh, You'll see the title here is about setting our hearts on things above. Let me uh, read just four verses here at the beginning of chapter 3. And uh, then we'll look into this and glean the important truths and lessons. This is the word of the Lord. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. 
for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the understanding of this portion of his word. In all of Paul's epistles, there tends to be a very evident pattern that the first part of it is there's... Um, what they would refer to as declarative. He's declaring and proclaiming truths that we need to know of who Christ is, what he has done, and how it's that those truths are relevant to the, the, the ones he's writing to. Sort of doctrinal, some a lot of our doctrine of, of what we can say about God, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, especially about Christ, is usually from the first sections of Paul's epistles. And then it comes to a place where there's kind of a hinge and things change a little bit to where he moves away from saying this is who God is, this is what he's done, this is what he's done in Christ Jesus, and there's a hinge to where it shifts over to here's how you are to live as a result of your faith in Jesus Christ and accepting of these things God has done. See that? Declarative. And the second part, you know, is hortatory. Those are the fancy words they use. Uh, it's, this, it's the section that says, here's how you ought to live as a result of your belief and your faith in Christ, who has done these things for you. See that? We are, in Colossians, as we get into chapter 3, we're hitting that hinge. Prior to this, there's been teachings. Now, it's, not that the, it's not that the doctrinal and the declarative and the proclaimed truth about Christ doesn't have some application. We can certainly always find that out. Uh, in fact, chapter 2 ended with things like uh, warning them about devoting themselves to these man-made or human traditions. Like, you know, do not touch, do not touch, do not do this, do not. In other words, to believe that somehow there was this ascetic, you know, to resist and to have ri uh, rigid fasting from certain things, that somehow that, were, that could, uh, that that served as a um, I don't know, some kind of uh, exalted spirituality because you're resisting the material things, the, the physical things. There's an application. Because Christ is supreme, because in him the fullness of deity lives in, you know, in, in, in full form, and he has done these things, then don't look to earthly things to satisfy what Christ has already done. That's in, in practices. That's essentially the idea. So there's heavy high Christology, fancy word for the doctrines about who the person and the work of Jesus Christ is, and then there's an application. So there's applications. But it's not, but when we hinge here, we're going to get into a section where it's going to get very direct. You read those, and it's more about here's how, here's how you ought to live. But we're at this hinge here. Since, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Okay, that's looking back to some of the things that we just said about our relationship and our union with Christ, then, okay, since this is the truth, since this is who you are in Christ, then, and then it goes on to say, here's some things important. Now, we're going to get, it's even going to get more practical, sort of more down to earth later, but today, it's about setting our hearts on things above, on heavenly things. Um, how about that be our first point? What does it mean to set our hearts on things above? Well, first of all, to be able to understand that, we need to understand what the, it's not only, this isn't only a New Testament thing. The idea of the, the cardia, the heart in Greek, and um, well, right now the Hebrew word of the Old Testament is eluding me, but there's a similar word. The, the New Testament, uh, the apostles and others in the New Testament picked up this concept, this idea of what the heart is from their Hebrew past, and they continued to speak about it that way. Now, if you and I, if we were, if, I mean, I think I used this expression yesterday in that little statement when I said to Abby and Alex, we love you with all our hearts. In our kind of worldview, in our way of linguistically putting all that stuff together, in our way of thinking, usually when we refer to heart, we are referring more to what? emotional aspects of our humanity. 
We love you in our heart. In other words, the deepest uh, parts, the deepest and, and, and the most significant emotional, you know, whatever, is active when I'm thinking of you. That's what we mean by loving our heart. So we're speaking with the emotional. That's not, if you, if you only think that way, then you're going to miss what the Bible is talking about when it says heart. Um, it's a much more comprehensive idea. When the New Testament, and even the Old Testament, really almost anywhere that the Scripture speaks of the heart, first it's not the, you know, the, the cardiac muscle. Okay? Just like we often will say something about heart, we're not talking about the cardiac muscle. Um, it is not only the emotion, but it is the seat, it's that central component of our human existence that incorporates really everything that's part of our humanity. It includes our intellect, okay? So reasoning intellect. It includes our emotions, it's all part of it. It also includes conscience, that aspect of our, you know, of ourselves that responds as a result of right and wrong, good and evil, etc. And makes us feel that you know, feel something about that. And also what we call volition, our will, the will. When the Bible speaks of the heart, it's speaking of that central component of our human experience that incorporates all of those. So if we read it like we tend to talk about it in terms of our, you know, contemporary English and you know, American way, we're going to really miss that, aren't we? If we're only speaking about it as some kind of an emotional feeling or expression, then we're going to miss the fact that here Paul's saying, since you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above. And when he's, when he's saying that, he's really saying your whole self, every aspect of your psychological and emotional and spiritual makeup should be given to these things that are above. Everything. Now, it's going to follow with set your mind. Why is that? I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll get to that. The heart is the broader. It's the more comprehensive way of saying it. And then he actually gets specific about the mind. And I, I will address that. But here it is. So, so you got that? So in a biblical sense, if you, if you were to tell somebody, I love you with all my heart, you're not saying, I just love you because I feel all this emotion and I kind of have this wonderful affection toward you. But rather, I love you with all my heart means all my thoughts, all my emotional and volitional and intention and purpose is given over to you. You know, it's everything. Now you see, if when you understand that biblical concept of heart, we're not talking about a small, like insignificant, introductory statement Paul is getting to. He is, he is calling them to something rather significant. Of course, it should warn us about compartmentalizing our lives a little bit. I mean, I, I mean people, I've heard preachers and teachers and youth workers, all sorts of people at times warn a Christian, say, look, you know, it's going to be very easy you know, let's, let's say like time, compartmentalizing our time, you know. Somebody the other day was telling me this. You know, it's one thing to be on Sunday morning thinking and doing these things, but then, hey, what do you do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? You know, when you have to go to school, when you have to go to work. You understand, there's like, uh, they want the faith to be so live and active, they want the grace of God at work, that if this is something that characterizes them all the time. Well, in this case, it's not so much about time as much as about your life. Well, you know what, I'll, I'll kind of give my you know, I'll give this to the Lord, but you know, I want to reserve some of this and kind of then, then you know, satisfy myself on these things. And here he's really calling them to a complete and a comprehensive giving of themselves to these things that he says are things from above. Well, what are these things from above? It's a pretty broad statement, right? I mean, I, uh, in some ways, one way to find what the things above are would be anything that God has made known to us that is for our understanding, knowledge, and, you know, and goodness and holiness and righteous love. In other words, everything that you find in the Bible, which then becomes a pretty massive thing, right? I mean, it's, it's huge. Now, if you get more specific, you obviously realize in this, in this reality, in, in the context of Colossians, let me remind you, it's likely 
Again, I, there's one commentary that I'm benefiting from greatly, a guy named Kent Hughes wrote, and he keeps referring to these Gnostics. I think everything that I read, uh, pretty much the New Testament epistles, that Gnosticism as a whole comprehensive system was not really developed yet. It might be late in the hundreds AD or 200s, uh, early 200s, before this really comes together. However, it is, seems to be apparent that some of the ideas that were part of that were around, and they probably are influencing the Colossians and others. And they had some unusual things. So some of those things we've been seeing along the way reflect something that is probably later becomes part of Gnosticism. And it's things like, you know, this is said, they treated all material things as if they were evil. That's not a biblical view. I mean, you don't have to get out of Genesis chapter 1 until you realize that's not right. Every, every day of creation, what was, the, what was the evaluation of God? God saw that what he created, and it was good. And on day, and on day 6, what did he say? I'll tell you literally what the Hebrew Bible says. He saw what he made. You know what was made? It was all language. And then mankind, humankind, in his image. And he said what? He saw what he made, and it was, I'm going to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in tongues and then I'm going to interpret for you. He said it was tov, tov. Good, good. And the Hebrew way of, in the Hebrew way of, uh, of, of, you know, we would say very good. And that's the way it's usually translated. By repeating the word. And so, I don't know if you've ever, uh, ever heard that. It's, it's not good formal English. You're not supposed to repeat things. You know, it's, oh, that was very, very good. That's not... If you have to say very, very, you need to find another adverb or adjective or something. That's formal English. But it's really good biblical Hebrew. Tov, tov means it was really good. He saw what he made when he made mankind, humankind, male and female, after the image of God. And he says, this is very good. Now, yes, I know you get into chapter 3 and you realize the sin brought this enmity uh, between the humans, uh, between the humans and the creation, and a separation from God. Okay, that's our basic spiritual problem. We often just refer to it as sin, but sin is a condition. It separates us from God, as well as the effect of the human nature. But the, uh, the issue here is that that doesn't change the fact that still things are good. We just sang about that. I didn't intend for that to come together like that. For the beauty of the earth. And then all those stanzas just started pointing out all these things. I like that one, you know, because you know I've studied psychology and all, but the, 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 the correspondence of the things out there and to our sight and sound, how, how the, if, you know, that verse that said the, the wonder and the beauty of how those fit together, right? How we look at flowers and how we, 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 see, a, we see a beautiful sunset. We see these things that are created, and we don't just say, Wow, that's a very efficient, proficient thing. No, we say it's a beautiful thing. And even we don't know how to even describe it. There's something that happens in the depths of our heart. It's good. So those kinds of things were there. And so uh, that, that was the, the, the calling of things evil was just a wrong, it was just a distorted and a messed up understanding. And so that's why they would have these things like, you know, do not eat these foods, do not do that, uh, do not do this. They wanted to resist that. However, they also had these religious practices that they may have borrowed, you know, from the Jewish past. Some of those were mentioned before. But also this belief that somehow there had to be this inland, like, uh, series of intermediaries between us and God. God who was pure spirit and therefore purely good. There had to be this endless number of emanations or spirits they got us there. And you know that's wrong too. There's one mediator between God and man, and it's Jesus Christ. So chapter 2, when we kept seeing that, in Christ and in him alone is found this mediation and this reconciliation to God. Don't look to the spiritual realms. Don't look to the, uh, to the practices, whether it's harshness of resisting material things or foods or practices or rigid observance of certain religious rites. Don't look there, look to Christ, because in him, your faith, you have died to sin and you have been raised to a new life. I've just summarized what the general 
flow of chapter 2 was. Now, as a result, put your heart on things above. So if the context tells us anything of what those things above are is, you need to constantly be reminding yourself and being reminded of who you are as a believer united to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. You need to be reminded of who he is, what he has done, what he's done for you, and who he is to you, and how that union of faith has brought you to who you are and, and what it has done in you. You're going to hear more about that in our study and the sermons here than about, I hear some of you have been doing such and such. You don't need to be doing that. God is displeased with that. You know, that's that tone. Now, there's places where the Bible tells us, don't do this. And when we get there, I'll tell you, don't do that. But I'm going to tell you not to do it, not because you just need to do better and get better so God will be pleased with you. But I'm going to tell you don't do it because as one who has been united to Christ in faith, clothed in his righteousness, your heart been transformed, that is the proper conduct fitting of somebody who is, who is clothed in him, who is united. See that? It's a whole different, it's very different, isn't it? Do this and don't do this so God will be happy with you and he'll send you blessings. Or, Here's the life, here's the conduct, here's the way of behaving and conducting yourself because that's what is the natural flow of a life that has been changed in Christ. This is the product of being united to him. Being, and how's this saying here? It's you, verse three, you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life, and then he looks forward to the future glory. But why is... And, and we're going to get there. There's going to, we're going to get very practical teaching in Colossians to husbands, wives, children. I know, as hard as it is, masters, slaves. Yeah, we'll have to figure that one out. And so it's going to get down and dirty. It's going to get more down to earth and very real. But you see, where it's coming from is not just do it yourself so God will be happy, send you blessings, but rather, this is the proper kind of life and conduct that flows out of this dynamic, spiritual transformation and renewal and union that you have in Christ. So if that tells us anything, what we need to do is we need to, that needs to all our minds, conscience, intellect, and our whole hearts must be saturated in those truths. Constantly being told, reminded, assured, comforted by who Jesus Christ is to us and what he's done. You see that? So, yes, in one way it's all the stuff. But in another way, maybe specific, specifically saying we must continue. Just go back. Who is Christ? What's he done? And what does that mean as you, for you as one who is united in him? All right, so now why does it go to mind? Well, although the mind or the intellect is one of the aspects of what the heart is, it seems like the mind has a special role because, see, that's really where you get connected with the content. I mean, we don't just absorb it. You know, we don't just absorb the gospel. Now, the gospel comes through what? Through, through the preaching and the hearing. There, there is content that is intellectually discerned. The mind is important to get us, to, to receive that and to understand it. So the broad or the comprehensive setting your hearts, it's almost as if this is telling us how we will get our whole hearts you know, on things above is by especially focusing on setting the mind. So intellectually processing and hearing. Now some of that. We have some intellectuals in here. But people who are driven. I mean, you, and sometimes I'm like that. I just love to just disappear with a whole stack of books and just, you know, that's not what we're speaking of here. We're not speaking of retreating to the mind being, you know, lost in the intellectual things. 
Even if those are the things from above, the, the godly things, the divine things, it's more of letting the mind lead you to careful study and discernment so that then you are equipped and able to give the whole of yourself to the things. You see that? So the mind is sort of the way you get there. And uh, so it's more specific. It's one of the aspects of the whole heart, the whole being. But that's really the way we get, you know, it's the way we, the way we get there. Um, if it's illustrative or helpful, I heard during the Olympics, I think it was during watching some wrestling. I don't really watch wrestling very much, but I saw some of it. And it's kind of interesting to watch them sit there, you know, and they kind of, it's almost like they're doing nothing, but they're not doing nothing. You know, they're, 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 they're just, I mean, they're locked up. And I found it, I found it um, almost humorous at times where they're locked up, looks like they're doing nothing. Now, all of a sudden, one of them would take a hand and grab the other person's head and do this hard swipe. And they would resist it and then hold their position. Or they didn't resist it. And if they got the head moving, what happened? They got their head moving one way. They usually got the whole body to move that way. And I think I heard one of the commentators say, you know, where the head goes, the body goes. Now that's a physical illustration of what this might be. Maybe you said this one. Where the mind goes, the heart will go. Just as where the head goes. Now, if you've done any athletics at all, I mean, I, I, I probably didn't know all that it meant all the time when I played football. But they say, you know, your head is, that's a very important part of it. If you're going to block somebody, you got to get your head on the right side. If you're going to tackle somebody and prevent them from getting somewhere, you've got to get your head on the right side. The head, the head is important. And if we use that sort of illustratively, you'll see the mind, the head is important and the mind is important as well. The mind will enable the heart to get to where it needs to be. So if the mind is set on the things above, this demands study. It, you know, it's important for us to study. Well, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible I don't understand. Exactly. That's exactly why you have to study. You know? I know. I've used that excuse. I don't really like doing that because I'm not very good at it. Well, that's why you need to do it. You'll get better when you do it. Uh, you know, that's what it, So it, it actually, it, it demands of us more diligent study and contemplation and, and, and discernment. Sitting under the preaching and the teaching and studying ourselves. So where the mind goes, the heart goes as well. So, so there's an emphasis there. That's where if you focus on that, you'll do it. But now don't let your mind get carried away to pull you, just pull you deeper into exclusively intellectual contemplation. But let it lead the whole being there. Okay, let me wrap up on this. Here's the thing. It's our union with Christ that is, that is the that I think are, is really describing what the things above are here, the heavenly things, the divine things. Uh, verse 3, to be reminded of this is important, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then, of course, there's a hope of what that means for the future. What kind of faith would it be? What kind of faith would the Christian life be if all we had to do was give you a bunch of platitudes to be able to kind of help you endure day by day in this life and there was no hope of future glory? I'll tell you what it'd be. It'd be such a faith that, honestly, we're wasting our time being here. I don't know. These are the, these are the things that we, we uh, will we'll, we'll struggle with. But there's a, there's a hope of the new life now that's in us by union with Christ. And then there's the hope of life then uh, beyond the grave or especially looking forward to this assurance Christ said he will return. When is it going to be? I don't know. In fact, I think we're discouraged from, from trying to decipher that. We are to observe things and that should prompt us to be ready what does ready mean? Mean faithful, having faith, being receptive and responsive. That's the primary application of any of the teachings of eschatology. That is what is to come, whether it's the end of this this life or Christ's return or final judgment or what the eternal glory of the state is. I don't know. I mean, we we're given various things, and sometimes I mean, I you know, every now and then I let my sanctified imagination, you know, and it. 
is probably going to be infinitely greater than even what I can picture in my mind. If those, if those images, those things in Revelation are to give us something to go on, it's going to be way even beyond what we can think. The glory that's to come. The great hope. Christian faith and life in Christ is, is about now, but it's not only about now. There's a hope that is to come. And you know, especially when we stand at the graveside or as we're approaching, you know, advanced years, as we're facing the uncertainty of the course of an illness, I mean, this would do you no good at all if we didn't have a living Lord. As we said earlier, he died when he was raised, now seated at the right hand. And notice here it points out that uh, you put your mind on things. There's probably another aspect of the things above is to think about Christ as seated at the right hand. What does that mean? He's in the place of privilege and power. Really. Son of God at the right hand is the place of privilege, power, and rule over his people. We're not here because we're here. We're here because Christ has ordained this institution, this or organism called the church, and he rules us by his spirit and his word, the revealed written word and the Holy Spirit in our lives. To think about those things. What does that mean that Christ is ruling us even now? And then what does it mean when he appears again? What does that mean? Now, I don't think we're supposed to live and be so caught up in heaven that we can't function in the here and now. But however, every now and then the Bible says, you know, you ought to think about this glory that's to come and let it give you great hope and encouragement in Christ. <clears throat> because without it, what kind of life would this be? What kind of faith would this be? <clears throat> We'd just be killing time until time killed us, right? But we have much more than that. We have a living Savior. Died to sin, was raised to life. Now is at the right hand of the Father and ruling us. And when he appears, we will appear, as I say, you will also appear with him in glory. Friends, that's our great hope. That's what we have to look forward to when Christ comes. So, that's the hinge. We're going to get down to the nippy grippy, as an old friend used to say. <clears throat> it's going to get very practical as we continue on. And uh, yet, there's the hinge. Why? Because we're united to Christ. He's the one who rules us. How about, let's conclude with 516. Jesus, I live to thee as our final song, but also our final prayer. How about one and four? Let's do the first one as we wrap up today.